generation. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. It's time once again for another round of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Hello, America. It is Fisher at this end. Great to have you aboard. I am your radio root sleuth. This is the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Boy, we got some great guests today. In fact, I'm going to dig into the vault of shows to bring you one that you probably haven't ever heard or maybe haven't heard in a long, long time. It's my old friend Hank Jones. He's a Hollywood actor that you may know of, and he shares a lot of stories about serendipity in family history. You know, when you do your family history research and strange things happen, he actually wrote books about this, and we're going to share one of our visits with Hank coming up here in about 10 minutes. Later in the show, we're going to talk to a lady from Fort Worth, Texas, who has, well, shall we say, virtually a flock of black sheep that she's dug up in her research. Sharon Manson's going to be on the show, so we're looking forward to that. Hey, if you haven't signed up for our Weekly Genie newsletter yet, of course you can do so on our Facebook page or at ExtremeGenes.com. You get a blog from me each week, a couple of links to past and present shows, and of course links to stories that you will find fascinating as a genealogist. And right now, it's time to head out to Boston, Massachusetts. David Allen Lambert is standing by, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. And hello, Canada. You know, I have to give a shout out to half of my ethnicity, you know. <laughs> Stick to the script, will you, Lambert? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's get on with it, shall we? Yes, sir. All right, well, first of all, what kind of week have you had? Yeah, make any great discoveries? Well, I was writing two lectures on Revolutionary War research, kind of redoing them, if you will. And while looking for an example, I said, oh, I wonder if he served. And I found another fifth great grandfather who qualifies as a Revolutionary War soldier up in New Hampshire. So there's just one more application fee I'm going to have to pay with the SAR. <laughs> Very nice. Congratulations. We've been going nuts here. And here's the big problem I've got, Dave. My wife, Julie, now is starting to get into this. And uh, she wants to write the story of her father, who was a newspaper photographer. She also got some material from her brother recently. These were various little items he had pulled out of an old family Bible and sent them on. One was a small picture. It was one and a quarter by one and three eighths inches. Really, really tiny. And we blew it up. And it was my wife's great grandmother on a telephone, like around 1915. It's a really cool picture. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot, too. And then there was a Social Security card in there of her great grandmother. And I had looked at it, hadn't really thought much about it. But she noticed, well, wait a minute, there's an address on there I'm not familiar with with my great grandmother. And there's the name of a business on it. So she started researching it. And we figured out that her great-grandmother in her 70s was working at a munitions factory in northern Indiana during World War II. Well, apparently she survived that job. Yes, yes. Nothing went boom, which is very good. And then we were looking for more pictures her newspaper photographer father had taken back in the day. And we found that one of them was actually clipped by somebody and placed in a dossier. The FBI dossier of Martin Luther King. Well, you've had a more interesting week than I have. I'm just digging up dead people from 250 years ago that <laughs> held the gun. <laughs> right. No, I think you had a great week, but this has been insane. We just keep going over these things and finding more and more stuff. And it's like, you know, I've been doing this a long time. You'd think you'd have it all by now, but it's never that way. So let's get on with our family histoire news. What do you have for us, Dave? Well, I want to start off with a nice article by Molly Campbell, who's a science writer for a website called technologynetworks.com. And she talks about a variety of different things, how DNA and discoveries and genomics have really opened up and changed history or confirmed history. Part of the article is really great. It talks about the discovery of over 400 Viking skeletons that were found a number of years ago, and they've done DNA analysis. Did you realize that some of the Vikings were actually not blonde? Most of them were brunettes, according to this cemetery's dig. 
Wow. Viking raiding parties are an activity for local individuals, kind of like when you went to go see a football game. <laughs> it's a great story. you got to read it. There's lots of components to it. Of course, DNA has been a great part of crime solving. And now we have a case in 1978 in Rutherford County, Tennessee, where they're looking for the help of local individuals to give their DNA, also looking for people to help fundraise so they can raise the money to solve a cold case from over 40 years ago. And you know, Dave, this is really true all over the place. There is a case up in Idaho where there was a grant, I guess, issued for dealing with cold cases to do the testing. And there's a group in my area called the Honorary Colonels, and it's a group of pretty wealthy business people who support local law enforcement. And when a case comes up that requires expensive DNA testing and processing, they help fund it. So there's really a need right now for individuals to contribute to help solve these cases. But I'm thinking at some point, we're going to start seeing governments actually budget some funds for this kind of work. It's amazing. Stop and think about the time frame. The Civil War was over 150 years ago now, okay? How about an 88-year-old man in Washington, D.C., Daniel Smith, a veteran himself, talked about his dad, who was born in 1863, born as an enslaved individual. How many people alive today can say that? You know what? You consider that we only recently started losing all the children of the Civil War vets. The youngest would have had to have been born in the 1840s, but an enslaved individual could have been born anywhere in the early 1860s and still have somebody living today if they fathered a child late, right? That's very true. You know, when you're out hunting for mushrooms, you never know what you're going to find. Mushrooms are yummy, but I'd like to find what this guy found in the Czech Republic. How about a 3,300-year-old bronze sword? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I go out and I find pull tabs you know, <laughs> on the ground. Yeah, right? Maybe I should start hunting for mushrooms. I'll find swords. Well, as the holidays progress and you're looking for that gift of your favorite genealogist, Think about American Ancestors. You can save $20 on your membership using the coupon code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org. Talk to you soon. All right, David. Yeah, at the back end of the show, as we do Ask Us Anything, coming up next, I'm going to talk to Hank Z. Jones, the former actor. He's a genealogist, and he talks about serendipity in genealogy. There's weird stuff that happens out there. You're going to enjoy it. Coming up in minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. You know, whether you're new to family history, a seasoned pro, or you've simply missed the event in years past, now's your chance to connect at Roots Tech Connect, the world's largest family history conference. For the first time ever, this event is 100% virtual and 100% free. That's right, virtual and free. Now you can discover your heritage from wherever you are. Imagine three full days of discovery, dozens of classes to choose from, taught by presenters from around the world, all from the comfort of your couch. Oh, and don't forget the exciting celebrations of music, food, dance, and traditions from around the globe. Enjoy inspiring keynote addresses and learn from top-notch speakers and see yourself in the story of the human family. Discover your story. Discover Roots Tech Connect. Live online February 25th through 27th, 2021. Register for free at RootsTech.org. That's Roots Tech Connect, free at RootsTech.org. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process, and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree genealogists we do the research you enjoy the discoveries well genies what a time we're all going through right now 
And with all this time on our hands, you probably agree the best lemonade we can make out of this is to sharpen our genie axes and learn how to extend our family trees, gather more photos and documents, and discover those remarkable family stories our descendants can benefit from for generations. Well, I have more time now, too, and I want to help you learn what you need to know. That's why I've created a new Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. I'm so pleased that so many of you have already signed up and are helping us to create a supportive community of family history researchers. On this page, we can brainstorm and share ideas on how to tear down those brick walls that we all have. So feel free to join us. The Facebook page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Feel at home with others who live in our genie world and want to make the most of this unique time. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Join us. Welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I wanted to share with you today one of my favorite all-time segments. It's with Hank Jones. He's a former actor. He's a fellow of the American Society of Genealogists, a fellow with the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, a lecturer. He's written books on the Palatine families of New York and a couple of books called Psychic Roots, Serendipity, and Intuition in Genealogy. And what a conversation we had on that. I was amazed he even had time to talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) Keeps me off the streets. I guess so. Well, let's talk about this serendipity thing because we hear about it all the time. And for people who may not have gotten into genealogy yet or family history research, you might be surprised at some of the stories that happen. And it certainly happened to me early on. How about you, Hank? Did you ever have an experience right at the beginning? Uh, yes, it just and it just kind of built from from then on. It did, they just start happening right and left. And uh, at first, I thought I was the only one getting a little too close to the butterfly net. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know what was going on. What happened was, is I I wanted to find out if really this was just me that was this was happening to. So I sent out 200 letters, oh probably about 15 years ago, to some of the leading genealogists around the world, and I said, now I'm not knocking the scientific approach to genealogy because my fellow fellows from the ASG and all of the great scholars of genealogy over the years, you know, make the point that this is really a scientific thing we do with best it, when it's done right. Right. But I wanted to know once in a while that something happened that you just couldn't explain that somehow led you to success in, in climbing the family tree that, that uh, you weren't expecting. And I'm up to, I'm up to 1,300 uh, experiences shared from our fellow genealogists wow. around the world now. And so it, it does happen. I started very young. Uh, I, I've been writing books since my days at Stanford in, in the 1960s on the Palatine families of New York. These are German immigrants that came in the 18th century, right. colonial America. Well, the wild thing was, to my knowledge, I didn't descend from any of them, yet I almost felt compelled to write about them. And the main center of the thing is I wanted to find as many of the ancestral homes of these 847 families that come to New York overseas in Germany. And so I found a little lady over there who would literally go village to village for me where I had theorized these places would be, because this is way before a lot of microfilming was available, and certainly before the Internet. Anyway, I had no vested interest in any family. I, I didn't descend from any of them that came to America. So she said to me, well, where will I begin? I gave her all these names. She said, I said, I don't care. You got to, I want to find them all. She said, no, we have to start somewhere. So I said, okay. I, I'd always been interested in a guy named Dietrich Schneider, one of the 847, for some reason. I said, we know he came from Hockenberg, Germany. Okay, Carla, go there first. We've got to start somewhere. So she did. So, dissolve, as we say in the movie, right. to about 15 <laughs> or 20 years later. Uh, since that time, I've found over 600 of the 847 families. 1,500 later arrivals have come to America in the 18th century. And the only family that I am directly related to of that group is the Dietrich Schneider family of Hockenberg. My first choice selected totally <laughs> off the wall, out of, at random, for Carla to look for in her searches for me in Germany. Unbelievable. And, and how many generations back are we talking? Yeah, okay. a long, long, long time back, about eight, somewhere around there. And then other things start happening. I had to do lectures about the Palatines around the country. I've lived in the West Coast all my life and been a few trips to the East Coast, but, but never a lot. But when I would go back sometimes to speak in a place where the Palatines lived on the East Coast in New York or New Jersey, in a couple of instances, uh, the local historian would be taking me around to show me the sites. 
And I would tell the local historian what was going to be around the bend in the road before we got to it, and I'd never been there before. Oh, boy. And just really spooky <laughs> stuff like that. And, and how could you explain that? What do you think it was about? I don't know. And that really is the success, I think, of the Psychic Roots book. We're in our ninth printing now, and I have no agenda. I don't know why it happens. I just know this stuff happens. So what I basically say is it happens, enjoy it, and use it. Because if there's a feeling that is common to genealogists who are sort of at least open to this, is that if you allow yourself to be led in your searches, it's amazing what you're going to find. I would say follow your hunches and see if the facts back them up and you have nothing to lose. You just more added information that might work for you, and so often it does. Tell me about your serendipitous experience. Um, a couple of them, actually. When I first started, I was 26 years old, living in Florida, went to New York to the archives there, and happened to pick a week where it was the worst weather they had had in years. And so we're the only people in the archives, my wife and I. I mean, that the snow is hitting us sideways as we got off the train to go into the city. And, of course, nobody else was dumb enough to be in the New York archives in weather like this. It was just yeah. us and the poor sucker who had to actually operate the office there. And he was not happy to be there. And uh, so we started going about our business, and again, this is before the Internet, going through some microfilm. And halfway through the day, one other person showed up out of the 13 million in the New York metropolitan area, sat next to me because that's where one of the only other microfilm readers that actually worked was sitting. And she overheard me say, oh, Catherine Anspake. She says, excuse me, did you say Anspake? I said, yes. She says, well, that's a very rare name in early New York. I have a friend on Long Island by that name. Maybe he's tied to you. And I, I had no idea. I was just getting going. Anyway, we exchanged information. And in time, we figured out we were fourth cousins. And he became a resource for me. We're still in touch after 33 years. Oh, my gosh. And, and what are the odds, you know? The, the, the odds are formidable. And that, ha the, that happens a lot. He, he, actually, even my own book, Psychic Roots, took a life of its own. I was at Salt Lake City at the big library, the Family History Library, you know, at my own table doing, doing a lot of intensive research, not even looking up. And all of a sudden, I did look up because here comes this lady leading about 20 people behind her. She was the guide of the library and was telling the, the newcomers to the library, you know, where the stacks were, where the microphone readers were and all that stuff. And she happened to walk by my table. And just as she's walking by my table, she says to her 20 people, why, yes, there's even a book out about psychic roots and about <laughs> intuition and serendipity and genealogy, <laughs> to which I stood up immediately and said, I know, I wrote it, and I sat down. <laughs> well, that had to be pleasing. It was pleasing. It was fun. <laughs> Who to think that would happen at that particular time? The timing, the timing of stuff can can be weird. There's a one of my favorite stories was sent to me by Reverend Schuster, who was a minister in the Midwest, and for years he'd wanted to go back east to the East Coast to go to the gravestone of his Schuster ancestors, where they're buried on the East Coast. And for 25 years he'd wanted to do this, but he had a very big congregation. He could never get away from the pulpit to do it. So finally he just it was sort of like put up or shut up time. He said, I got to do this. So he went back to the town in New York where he where his ancestors just lived, the Schuster family, and he went to the cemetery. And as he walked into the cemetery, he gulped, he told me, because it wasn't just a village cemetery. This was a cemetery that had lots and lots, almost a thousand graves just over Hill and Dale of that particular area of, of uh, upstate New York. And he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how he'd ever find his Schuster ancestors' grave. So he found the section of the cemetery who would happen to be walking just near the entrance. And he said, would you happen to know where my Schuster ancestors would be buried. And immediately, the section of the cemetery took him to the graves he had been looking for for 25 years. And Reverend Schuster said to the section, well, how did you ever know out of all these gravestones where the Schuster family's buried without looking it up in your files? And the section told him that he was the fifth person that day to ask for that particular grave. And with that, the section pointed to a hollow on the hill overlooking the whole cemetery where the 25th annual Schuster family reunion was taking place. <laughs> and as Reverend Schuster said, I walked up the hill and I met my family. Unbelievable. And yeah, how long ago did. was this? When was this? Well, he told me the story about 20 years ago. Isn't that something? 
It, you know, just the timing of these things are, can be very weird. Uh, it just it just happens over and over again. I had a good friend talk about you you doing your radio show. There was a a guy uh, who's deceased now named Nick Vine Hall, who was sort of like the Larry King of of Australian genealogy, and he had a radio show once a week all throughout New, uh, Australia and New Zealand about genealogy. And Nick came to America and was telling me some stories that had, had been told him on the air. And Nick said the most common story I'm told on the air is this. And it had variations, and basically it's the same story. It's this. I was looking for my ancestor. I went to the cemetery where my ancestor was buried, but I'd never been there before. I got out of the car, and I walked straight to my ancestor's grave. Yes. I have heard that story, too. Yeah. Isn't that something? It's like they're calling to you. In the in the forward to the first Psychic Roots volume, Helen Hinchcliffe, uh, one of our fellow fellows, Put it nicely, too. She said, you know, Hank, she said, feeling about one's ancestors as well as thinking about them usually results in a far more successful search. And that's really true. I'm a big champion of genealogies that are not just names and dates. I mean, you ever read a genealogy with just names and dates? Oh. You know, spare me. Right. But <laughs> it's, it's our job to put flesh and, flesh and blood on the skeleton of names and dates and make them come alive again. And it's great to honor your Mayflower ancestor and your Revolutionary War soldier, but don't forget to honor the horse thief, too, because they, too, have their stories, and sometimes they're a heck of a lot more fun. <laughs> I can't argue with you on that point. My my favorite ancestors are some of the biggest scoundrels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt. I don't know how it works. I just think that our ancestors want to be found. And it's sort of our soul's task to do it. This is what we do. We're genealogists. I mean, trying to explain our excitement to a civilian is beyond us because they don't, <laughs> they don't get it. No, no you're we're, absolutely we're, right. We're, I'm, I'm weird cousin Hank who likes dead people. That's fine. I am. I'm definitely weird. <laughs> well, but it, it's, 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 it's part of what we we're supposed to do. And that was another thing that uh, that came through in, in all these 1,300 letters and, uh, shared by genealogists, that this is what we do, it's what we're supposed to do. And uh, so we, we do it, and, and it's just part of our deal here. He's Hank Jones. He's the author of Psychic Roots, Serendipity, and Intuition in Genealogy. Hank, your book's still in print. How can they get it? Uh, actually, you can get it uh, through my website, www.hankjones.com. Excellent. Will you come back and we'll do some more? I'd love to, Scott. Thank you for asking me. And coming up next, it's one of those listeners who was always told as a kid, don't ask about that relative. Well, of course she did. She looked into it. She found a lot of stuff, and you're going to hear all about it coming up next on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show in five minutes. looking for ordinary people with extraordinary finds and sometimes those finds include a lot of black sheep hey it's fisher and welcome back to extreme genes america's family history show at extremegenes.com got a lot of black sheep in my family but i don't know that i have quite as many as my next guest sharon manson from <laughs> fort worth texas sharon welcome to extreme genes it's great to have you Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate your uh, agreeing to come on because, I mean, your list of black sheep is uh, rather lengthy. <laughs> and it's longer than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, when did you begin researching your family? Um, two, maybe two and a half years ago. Okay. We had always heard about my dad's mother, but we're not allowed to talk about her. It was oh. one of those things that, <laughs> you know, I remember as a kid, we had our Grammy, which is our mother's mother. And I remember as a kid going, why don't we have a Grammy for dad? And my mom's like, don't talk about it. <laughs> don't, don't even go there. Don't go there. So we never knew her. We yeah. just assumed that she had died when she was young. We knew that my dad and his brother were sent to live with his aunt. His aunt adopted his brother, but didn't adopt my father. He graduated high school and joined the service, and then he was in the service, and he met my mom, and then the ball went rolling from there. Sure. We never really knew my dad's father either because he didn't really live with him, but we didn't know anything about my dad's mother. So I was visiting, and they were giving us back our baby stuff because they've moved into an independent living facility. So they were giving us our stuff back. And lo and behold, in the baby book is – my grandmother's name is Gertrude on my mother's side, but my grandmother's name on my father's side is also Gertrude. So oh. there's Gertrude Manson listed in there. 
So that started me looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And, and I, off you went. I did a trial of Ancestry and then just started going, plugging things in of what I knew, what I could figure out. And I called my sister. I sent her a message, I think at 6 a.m. And I called her at 10 a.m. saying, I found everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I had started the night before, like at nine o'clock. And I had just gone straight. I was on this crazy adrenaline high of just finding stuff. Wait, wait a minute. You um, went all through the night, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Yes. Wow. That's why I, tell you, I sent her a message through Facebook so it wouldn't wake her up that said, I found some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you did. Wow. And the tree just kept going going and going and going and going and it was just crazy things just started falling in line and then of course hit some roadblocks but I found her I found her name I found her family and kind of hit some dead ends there turns out she lived in Lowell Massachusetts her whole life she died okay. in 1978 okay a lot later than you thought did you ever figure out why the parents were like don't talk about this this is something we don't discuss well, I hit this roadblock for a while, and then I stumbled on someone else's tree that had her listed, and it had the name of a son. And I started looking through the um, city directories, yeah, uh, going back and piecing those city directories where she was a Manson, and then she disappeared. And I found a marriage index where it had a Patrick Henry Smith and Gertrude Estelle Wright. Yeah. So I wrote off to Massachusetts to get a copy of that marriage certificate. And it came back and it said, this marriage was annulled, no further information can be provided. Okay, so basically she gets married a lot. I guess she left my dad, his brother, and her husband, my grandfather, for another man and had a child with him. Yeah. And then he found out she wasn't divorced yet, so <laughs> the, the marriage was annulled. <laughs> and it's all in that same little area that she's living. Found that she lived with her son for a while. My dad has no clue. My dad is 88, so this guy would be 81. So they've obviously never met. And I finally find her obituary, which lists all of these things that confirm that she was married and that she has a son and the name of the son and, and all of that. Wow. Yeah. So it, it's all there. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's, it was just kind of funny just, how everything... It's all mapped out in one big sloppy mess. Yeah, oh, yeah. So what are some of the other black sheep you've run across? Well, when my dad was sent to live with his aunt Beatrice, Beatrice, at one point, she was in the Navy, and she was sent to Illinois, to the, the Navy base there, and she was in the steno pool or something there, even though she'd done all the Navy training. Funny, because back in the 20s, you know, they put all your business in the newspaper. Yep. But I ran across an article that said, wife claims husband is married to another or something like uh -huh. that. Aha, <laughs> here we go again. So she ended up marrying Harry Drake, but I guess she didn't because he was already <laughs> married and not divorced. So. She didn't know she wasn't married even yeah, though she was right. married, yeah. So she came back home to Boston. And was married off to Wyman Allen. And so that's who my dad ended up living with is Wyman and his Aunt B. Okay. And so he lived with them, and then they adopted his brother but did not adopt my father. Right. For whatever reason, I'm not sure. Complications, um, complications. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about some of the other black sheep. Well, Beatrice's daughter, Ruth, she married, and they had four children. And then when she passed away, he dropped all the children off at an orphanage and took off. Wow. Yeah. The granddaughter contacted me and asked for some information. We got that <laughs> through the DNA through 23andMe. And so she reached out and she said, somehow we're related. And I think it's because my father was adopted and we're trying to find his full parents. We think it's Ruth West. Wow. And so I sent her pictures. So Such devotion that, in your family, I'm noticing. Yeah, because if we go on my mother's side, uh, we've got some good things going on there. Okay. Because my grandmother, her husband, Thomas Atkinson, he apparently was married before he married my grandmother. And we did find last summer, I was with my mother scanning some pictures, found this picture of somebody named Dorothy. And I said, who's Dorothy? And she said, I have no clue. I start doing some searching for some Dorothy Atkinson, and I find a marriage certificate for Thomas Murray Atkinson and another woman, not my grandmother. And sure enough, they have a daughter, Dorothy Atkinson. And he left her, for whatever reason, 
divorced, and then he married my mother, Gertrude Mary de Bruin. Now, her father <laughs> uh -oh. was kind of known as the cad in the de Bruin family. So he left them early on, and he ended up with another woman he left. So have you found any criminals, Sharon? No, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> None of that yet. Good. My sister did 23 and Me and then gifted it to everybody. And so we have these names that pop up that if it's only my mother and her brother that are from her mother and my grandfather, I can't figure out how on earth to fit them in there. So I think there's something more with my grandfather. Well, it sounds like it. It sounds like they were always happy to meet someone and always happy to meet someone new. <laughs> Isn't, yeah. <laughs> isn't it amazing how we all get here? You know, it's just yeah. from certain moments in time that couldn't happen any other way. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Sharon, for sharing your stories here. This has uh, been quite a run for you. <laughs> Congratulations. <Yeah>. And <laughs> and good luck with finding all these half cousins and step cousins and adopted cousins and all yeah. the people that come from this. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's really funny that when I start going back on that tree, everything comes back through Gertrude Manson. And so I'll call my sister and go, hey, look, there might be a way that there's someone that's one of the culvert families in Connecticut, but it looks like the tree goes through Gertrude Estelle Wright. And then I'll come back to something else and I go, it goes back through Gertrude Estelle Wright. Every one of the, <laughs> every one of the things that you're like, wow, that's kind of cool. There might be like a Salem witch in there, like <laughs> okay. Susanna Martin. Yeah. And I'm going through that and I've got to verify everything. But initially it goes up to her. But when it branches off, it comes down through the through the Gertrude, family. which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on, Sharon, and sharing your tales and good luck in your All pursuit. Right, thank you so much. Well, David's coming back in just a couple of moments for another round of Ask Us Anything. We're going to be taking on questions about revolutionary soldier lineage societies and emigration from Canada to the United States. Where are the records? Dave has got some answers coming up when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, genies, what a time we're all going through right now. And with all this time on our hands, you probably agree the best lemonade we can make out of this is to sharpen our genie axes and learn how to extend our family trees, gather more photos and documents, and discover those remarkable family stories our descendants can benefit from for generations. Well, I have more time now, too, and I want to help you learn what you need to know. That's why I've created a new Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. I'm so pleased that so many of you have already signed up and are helping us to create a supportive community of family history researchers. On this page, we can brainstorm and share ideas on how to tear down those brick walls that we all have. So feel free to join us. The Facebook page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Feel at home with others who live in our genie world and want to make the most of this unique time. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Join us. At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process, and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. You know, whether you're new to family history, a seasoned pro, or you've simply missed the event in years past, now's your chance to connect at Roots Tech Connect, the world's largest family history conference. For the first time ever, this event is 100% virtual and 100% free. That's right, virtual and free. Now you can discover your heritage from wherever you are. 
Imagine three full days of discovery, dozens of classes to choose from, taught by presenters from around the world, all from the comfort of your couch. Oh, and don't forget the exciting celebrations of music, food, dance, and traditions from around the globe. Enjoy inspiring keynote addresses and learn from top-notch speakers and see yourself in the story of the human family. Discover your story. Discover Roots Tech Connect. Live online February 25th through 27th, 2021. Register for free at rootstech.org. That's Roots Tech Connect, free at rootstech.org. All right, on to the questions. It's Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, with David Allen Lambert over there in Boston. And, uh, David, our first question comes from Kelly in Jefferson City, Missouri. And Kelly writes, uh, guys, other than SAR and DAR, are there other revolutionary lineage societies that I should look at? Great question, Kelly. David, you are in, like, well, all of them, aren't you? I'm not in the DAR. Okay. All right. Yeah, but uh, but I am in the SAR, in the SR, and I'm in the Society of the Cincinnati. So here's my real question. Kelly, are you a gal or a guy? Because I could refer you to a couple of different ones. So there is an organization called the Society of the Cincinnati. It's actually the oldest hereditary organization from the Revolutionary War, started by the officers in George Washington in 1783, still very active. And there is a Daughters of the Society of the Cincinnati as well. So you can look into that organization. Now, the catch on that, it's different state by state. There's actually 14 Cincinnati organizations. And you think of the 13 original colonies. The 14th, you could probably guess, is who helped us, France. Yes, that's right. I remember this. So you have eligibility based upon representation. So if somebody is already represented by a descendant, so say hypothetically there's a John Lambert who served from Maryland, hypothetically, and I already am in his lineage, and I've joined as a member of the Society of Cincinnati, Nobody else can join, and I actually pick a successor member. So you may have an ancestor who qualifies as an officer, either in the Continental Army or was in the state troops for a number of years or was killed in action. But it has to be an officer, but it could already be represented. Now, there are other instances. For instance, the state of New Hampshire Society of Cincinnati allows you to go in under the brother of an officer. So for me, my direct society, the Cincinnati Connection, isn't an ancestor who was an officer, but his brother was. Now, I joined for life, and I cannot pick a successor member because the line's already represented. But because I'm going through a brother, I was able to get my membership. I really enjoy it. It's a great organization. But there's also great work by two groups that you may have heard a lot about. The Daughters of the American Revolution, which have done tremendous work for genealogists over the years and all their transcriptions and gravestone work and just their application itself for a wealth of information. And the SAR, who've also done the Patriot Indexes and the research that they've done on grave sites throughout the country, are great for patriotic use. Now, the SAR doesn't have as many members as the DAR. So I always tell the DAR ladies, Get your husbands involved or your brothers. Try right. To get them involved. And these are two organizations, as we move forward to the 250th, are very, very important. In fact, we've actually had the former national president of the SAR as a guest on the show a couple of times. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and we've had it from the DAR, too. That's true. That's very true. There's another organization you may have not heard of, and that's called the SR, not to be confused with the SAR. It's the Sons of the Revolution, which started originally at the time of the first centennial in the 1870s. And it was founded by men that basically couldn't join the Society of Cincinnati, but wanted to be actively involved. And it was a membership only by request organization. However, not everyone could join. So in 1889, they formed the SAR as a secondary group so anybody could join. Wow, so So the Sons of the Revolution actually were there first, and then the SAR followed along. When did the DAR start then? So the SAR was founded in 1889, and on October 11, 1890, the DAR 
All right, great question, Kelly. Thanks so much. We'll take on another one coming up here in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Back for our final segment on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It's Ask Us Anything. David Allen Lambert is here, and uh, we've got a question here from Stefan in San Francisco. David, he is asking about Canadian immigration in the late 19th century. Guys, can you tell me what sources might be out there to help me find my people? David, you are Canadian. This is perfect. I know, but I didn't arrive in the late 19th century. I do feel like that some morning, so. Right. <laughs> well, I can tell you that St. Albans border crossings are what you want to look at. So starting in 1895, so it's really at the close of the 19th century, they became more concerned with the crossings of Canadians because a lot of Canadians would come down seasonal for work, as they did with New England and the factories. In fact, they would come down with their spouses. They'd have the babies born in America, and then they'd go up and have them, say, baptized in Atlanta, Canada, or Quebec, and then they would eventually come down and settle. So their children had American business which is a wonderful thing that they wanted to be back in their traditional church, but they have the jobs down here. So St. Albans border crossings cover 1895 to 1954, and it's part of the National Archives microfilm. You would normally have looked at those blue boxes and crank the rolls, but thanks to Family Search, you can search these online, including four million plus images of all of the border crossings. I've used it to find my grandparents coming down in 1923 in Boston. My dad's folks came down from New Brunswick. Now, they didn't cross the border in St. Albans, Vermont. That's where a lot of people think, oh, they all came through the filter of one door. (laughs) No. (laughs) The entire Canadian border crossing collection is called St. Albans Canadian Border Crossings. Mine didn't even come by land. They didn't go by train either. They came by a ferry out of St. John, New Brunswick, and came into Boston. But because they crossed the border and came from Canada, they're included. And this is great because it gives you the names, the ages, the dates, where they're from, how much money they had on them. They're wow. just like you know, passenger list. Occupation? Mm, yes, occupation is occasionally listed on the two on the manifests or where you're going to go live. And these were good right through 1954. So I have a lot of my grandparents' cousins who would come down for visits in the 1930s and 40s and even later. And then you catch them just coming down for a visit. Doesn't mean they're coming to immigrate, but if they cross the border, they're recorded. It's a good database to start. You might find that your ancestor may have came over earlier, but it's possible that they went back and forth. And this is where you might catch them on a later list. Before then, it's a little hard. You will find the Atlantic ports where you'll find vessels coming down from, say, Atlantic Canada. And you'll see that they're from Canada. But they may not give you all the family. And it may not be every immigrant that's come down. So this is the more complete collection. And you'll also find this on Ancestry.com. Now, does this ever cover, say, Europeans who go to Canada first and then come down? Oh, Yeah, well, if you're a two-boater, as we call the people that come over from Europe, then over to Canada, (laughs) then down to America, they definitely will catch them. But, of course, it won't make any reference to their arrival from Europe, unless, of course, they just did it immediately. Sometimes people came, settled in Canada briefly, and then emigrated down. But it will say their place of birth, which would, of course, be a clear indication that they came from Ireland or England or Scotland, etc. Wow, would they ever give the specific towns? Sometimes they do. Depends how detail-oriented the enumerator of that list actually was. I mean, I've seen from my grandfather, sometimes it says Canada, and in some cases it says the French island that he was born, which is off the coast of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, uh, which is technically France. All right, David, thanks so much. And thank you, Stefan, for the question. And, of course, if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can always email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. David, thank you much. We'll see you next week. See you then. Let's put a wrap on this show for this week. Thanks for joining us. And if you missed any of it or you want to catch it again, listen to the podcast. We're on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, ExtremeGenes.com, all the big places. We're right there. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 